Good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening. Um, I'm Kate Ambler. I'm a research fellow at IFPRI, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this PIM webinar. Um, today, we'll be discussing uh, measuring employment and consumption in household surveys, reflections from three survey experiments. Uh, development economists and policymakers rely on household survey data to understand the populations that they work with. This includes describing you know, their state of being, poverty, employment, education, etc., but also understanding the benefits of programs that are implemented to alleviate poverty or to otherwise further our development goals. As such, really understanding how these questions are asked and the choices that we make in designing surveys might change the extent to which our data accurately reflects the world is really important. Um, more and more researchers are carefully paying attention to these questions. Um, and one strategy is to incorporate experiments into survey work, which can provide insight into specific types of questions. Um, in this webinar, we're going to review three such experiments um, conducted by researchers and co-authors at IFPRI um, and reflect upon what we've learned from these experiments and discuss um, you know, what more we can do in the future. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction of, of the presenters. First, we'll hear from Sylvan Herskowitz, who's a research fellow in MTID at IFPRI. Um, he will present um, joint work with me and with my wish, Meridia of MSU, on how respondent fatigue affects estimations of employment in repetitive labor modules and surveys. <clears throat> Second, Kabrama Bay, who is a country program leader and research fellow in the Development Strategy and Governance Division at IFPRI, uh, based in Cairo, will present how module placement impacts the measurement of dietary diversity in phone surveys. Um, and finally, Kale Hervanan, the senior research fellow in DSG at IFPRI, uh, will present his work um, investigating whether um, telescoping and changing um, the uh, in how we define the um, response, sorry, the recall period in consumption modules affects these estimations. Um, okay, before I hand over to Sylvan, a few notes on how we proceed. Uh, the presentations in the first part of the webinar will last for about 30 minutes and the rest of the time will be devoted to Q&A. Um, please feel free to put all of your questions in the chat window on the right side of your screens at any time during the webinar and then we will answer them during the Q&A as, as many as time allows. Um, and please let us know who you are and where you are from and what organization you represent uh, when you ask your question. Um, finally, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the PIM website shortly after uh, today's event. Um, great, so thank you so much for joining. And with that, uh, Sylvan, um, over to you to begin the presentations. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, and thank you everyone for either attending or participating and for those who organized for, for organizing. So, um, this is a project, as Kate mentioned, that I've been working on with her, as well as with our colleague, Maywish Moradia, over at MSU. Um, Kate, can you bring me over to the next slide? So similar to the, the motivation that Kate already provided, you know, 79% of the world's poor live in rural areas. Um, and we have a real interest in understanding how it is that they generate their livelihoods, because it's gonna affect a lot of the, the topics that researchers here um, at IFPRI or in the broader CGIR um, set of institutions really care about, things like employment for rural youth, feminization of agriculture, and employment and agricultural value chains are topics we all spend a lot of time thinking about. And motivation that's you know relevant to this paper, but of course to the other two as well, is that a lot of these topics rely heavily on household surveys, uh, and survey design could really impact data quality. Um, and maybe more troublesome or more concerning to us even than data quality is that it might induce systematic biases, which could really affect what we think we know about these topics. And so this paper looks at whether response, uh, fa response fatigue um, exists and is economically meaningful, uh, has differential impacts for different groups, speaking to whether it is actually inducing biases, and third, to try and understand a couple of the mechanisms. So next slide. Um, so by response fatigue, basically what we're, what we're thinking of is the deterioration of data quality over the duration of an interview as the respondent gets more and more fatigued or bored. Um, surveys, as we know, for many of us can be really long and arduous. They can span many hours or even days. 
And we want to emphasize that the primary respondent has two really important roles um, in this setting in our survey, but as well as many others, um, typically someone with senior standing in the household. But first and foremost, they provide a household roster. They say who else is there and in the household. And then second, they're very frequently asked to serve as proxies and to answer questions on behalf of other members. Um, and just to emphasize up front, we're thinking about fatigue that's happening just within the labor module. And we'll circle back to that in a second. Next slide. Now, we built our labor module off of the LSMS ones. It's a very standard format. It isn't just the one that we used in our study, but it starts by asking the respondent, did you do any productive activities in the last year? And if they say yes, then we ask them to identify their primary activity and ask them a number of follow-up questions. We then ask did any other activities, and if so, to define it in more follow-up questions. Then we ask in the last week to do any productive activities, and if it's different from the other two, to define it in some follow-up questions. So this leads to between zero and three unique productive activities identified for the respondent. Now they answer about themselves, and then typically they follow through the household roster order um, to answer these questions about the other members. Um, they're allowed to confer with the other household members if they're available, but more often than not, they end up reporting on their behalf. So very quickly, the respondent learns, look, if I just say that they did less activities, I can get out of here sooner, I can get on with my day. Next slide. Now, this is a sample that's taking place in Northern Ghana. This is actually a module built into a survey for a totally different project. Um, but you can think of Northern Ghanaians, we have about 1,100 households. Our analysis sample actually excludes the respondents, but it has 4,800 other family members. And mostly, you know, this is you know, rural northern Ghana. And so it's primarily household on farm activities, but there are some wage work and some household businesses that are mixed in as well. The main outcome variable that we end up using in our analysis is going to be the total number of jobs recorded for each individual. And you can see the distribution of that variable on the right. Um, but what we, uh, yeah, but going forward, basically, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit further. So next slide. Now, in the survey, the survey intro starts and the respondent is provides a household roster. And that initial household roster is in a very non-random order. Um, you know, oftentimes enumerators are even coached to help people walk through how they construct their rosters. Uh, so we gave some criteria along those lines, but this is very standard practice to start with a, with a roster ordering. Now, the second is in the labor section. Um, when we reach the labor section, the respondent is asked about all the other household members, and that's done in a randomized order. Um, so we take the original listing, we then mix it up when we actually get to the section on data collection. Now for the analysis, as I said, we exclude the respondent, and then we, in the analysis, also control for a number of things like household fixed effects, relationship to the respondent, gender, age, and whatever else. Um, now this allows us to ultimately identify the causal effect of being in a later response position on the number of labor activities reported about you. And we consider this, interpret this to be basically the effect of exposure to greater response fatigue on those outcomes. Next slide. Now, this is basically what the effects look like by order position, where the excluded group is number one, the person right after the respondent. You see that almost immediately, we see significant reductions in the number of uh, activities reported about an individual. And that effect appears to increase as you get further and further in the order. Next slide. Now you can also estimate that in regression form, showing an average effect per position further back in the roster order. And that is a reduction of 0 0.017 activities reported about an individual. That might not sound like much, but it ends up being a little more than 2% um, less activities reported about you. We consider these sort of losses in reported activities per position. And when you're thinking many of these households as in Northern Ghana, in fact, you could be in position four, you could be in position seven, eight. That aggregates up to being a pretty large effect. Now, that's the average effect, a bit over 2% per position in the whole sample. We look at whether that differs for different groups, and we see that those marginal effects are more than twice as big for women than they are for men, which means that it's more likely that activities that women did are going to be left off as the respondent gets more fatigued than they are for men. Um, you can also then switch in the third column and look at how this effect differs by different age groups, and it's those bottom two that have the largest effects. Although the point estimates are a little bit different for those two, they both end up being about 3% losses per position when you compare them to their, their relevant means. Next, next slide. Now, we, we care about those marginal effects. We think they're interesting and they're sort of vulnerability to fatigue for different groups, but we might actually care more about the aggregate effects if we care about whether this is economically meaningful. And across everyone, these aggregate effects are a bit more than 8.3% losses 
And again, by losses, I mean activities we suspect people actually did do, but were left off due to fatigue. Um, but if you want to understand these uh, aggregate effects by different groups, then you have to think about both the marginal effect um, as well as the natural listed order position. Normally, you wouldn't be randomizing the order of the household roster. You implement it in the order given to you initially. And so if you are going to be in a position that's later on, that can expose you to more fatigue. And so just for based off of those initial listings, I can say that women are on average 0.3 positions later than men, and youth are 1 to 1.7 positions later than non-youth. So again, exposing these groups to more um, to more fatigue. Now we can then calculate the percent losses. We do it in two ways where we only look at the ordering effects, assuming that everyone you know, is affected by fatigue in the same way. And then a second version where we also allow for differential fatigue effects. So next slide. So quickly summarizing these insights, for women, we said there isn't that big of a difference in their ordering position, which is why on the left, you see somewhat pretty similar uh, effects of fatigue on their overall aggregate losses. They're both around eight and eight and a half percent for both men and women. But when you allow for differential fatigue by gender, that's of course where we see that big split. We see women more than twice as affected as men with losses of about 11 or so percent. Next slide. A similar exercise can be done with the age groups. And to cut to the chase, basically we see that it's again the young age groups that are really affected um, with those effects driven both by the ordering effects and the different uh, impact of fatigue for these different groups, where it's about 12 percent losses for youth. And final slide. To conclude and summarize, um, I think we find meaningful aggregate losses. This is likely a lower bound of the overall effects of fatigue because it's only using variation within the module, a difference of where you're positioned in that labor order, that labor roster order. I think these it creates pretty meaningful biases by both gender and age. And I think we show these two me mechanisms, the differential marginal impacts and differential exposure. Um, and I just want to emphasize that as far as external validity, goes, this is not just a relic of our own survey. We've found really strong uh, ordering patterns in other surveys as well, where this might be affecting the data that they collect and that they have there. Um, and when you think outside of labor modules and as a transition into the work you're going to see in the next two papers, this can affect totally different topics. Really what matters is this format of a, of a module structure where you have an initial question and if you answer the in, in the affirmative, then you are asked a whole number of other questions, and then you repeat and repeat and repeat. And so one type of module you see that a lot is something like a consumption or an expenditure module. And when you reach that hundredth item, it's very likely that that respondent is pretty tired at that point. So with that, uh, that is the quick teaser for our paper and looking forward to questions. And I'll hand it over to Kibram uh, for uh, presenting his work. Thanks. Okay, uh, th thank you. Thank you, Sivan, and thank you, Kat. Um... Yeah, okay, so um, I'm going to build on, on some of the motivations that Sylvian uh, highlights, um, except that I'll be uh, focusing on uh, uh, fatigue in phone surveys. Uh, this is a joint work with my colleagues uh, and coaches, uh, Gush Burhane from IFPRI, uh, John uh, from Cornell, and Kabram Tafara from the World Bank. So, um, yeah, obviously, uh, we, we know that the outbreak of a pandemic or conflicts of uh, um, or pandemic of the, the type of COVID implies that uh, there is a need for monitoring welfare outcomes, even more particularly uh, in this in this context, including uh, welfare outcomes that that can measure food security and diet diversity. However, um, we also know that um, pandemics of the, the type of COVID-19 or conflicts of different types create substantial obstacles to conduct face-to-face uh, -face interviews and. Uh, because of this, we have seen a significant increase and a significant at attraction to employ remote data collection tools, uh, uh, including uh, computer-assisted telephone interviews, as, as I think many of, have, many of our paths have been doing. Uh, on the other hand, we know quite little about the implication of this shift in, uh, in, in the modality of data collection on data quality. Um, although fatigue uh, can, can be uh, Problematic on can affect both uh, uh, both a phone survey as well as face-to-face uh, -face surveys. Uh, longer interviews or fatigue uh, are more likely to be uh, impactful in phone surveys for several reasons. Um, and one of them is we know that um, there is huge cognitive burden and demand um, uh, required when when responding to uh, phone surveys than than uh, to face-to-face -face surveys. And we also know that. Um, 
enumerators have limited control uh, of the environment and the respondent during phone service. And um, this creates a significant challenge or a significant um, threat to data quality. And because of this, um, we are interested in evaluating the overall and the so, um, so we're using two rounds of phone survey data collected in June 2020 and December 2020. Uh, and we're building on uh, a face-to-face -face survey that had been um, running uh, before the arrival of the pandemic. And uh, the primary respondent for this uh, sample is uh, uh, mothers or caregivers of uh, the young child. And um, we originally had about uh, 2,500 households uh, in the face-to-face -face survey. And uh, in the first phone survey we had in June 2020, we reached about 60% of the sample. And uh, in, the, in the second round of the phone survey that we had in December 2020, we reached about um, about 1,100 of these households uh, or matters. Uh, we lost um, a quarter of the sample because of the war in Tigray. So uh, we introduced a simple innovation or a simple uh, uh, randomization in the second round of the survey that's in the December 2020 survey. We introduced a, a random assignment of respondents to different types of questionnaires. We, only, we have two questionnaire types where uh, they only differ in the placement of uh, the women's uh, dietary diversity module, where 50% of the respondents are assigned to receive this module right immediately after, after the, the consent form or the introduction of uh, the survey. And then uh, the remaining half are assigned to receive the same module uh, 15 minutes uh, uh, or in the middle of the interview. Can I go to the next slide? So uh, here we have some summary statistics and descriptive results. Um, these summary statistics and results are based on, uh, um, based on the data from the face-to-face -face survey, where we collected a um, um, large number of information and uh, demographic characteristics in, in the baseline survey, which serves as to uh, validate the balancing of the randomization as well as, as facilitate the identification of differential vulnerability. Um, so I, I'm, can I go to the next slide? Uh, here, what we can see is um, we have a long list of uh, baseline characteristics that you can see are uh, well balanced across the treatment and control group. And most importantly, we can see that uh, in the first round of this, the phone survey, um, both the control group and uh, treatment group matters report uh, statistically similar uh, matters, dietary diversity, as well as um, uh, uh, type of food groups that they consume. Next slide, please. And then here we, we, we follow a simple empirical strategy that, that is a simple uh, fixed effect specification where we have, we characterize um, uh, a diet diversity as a function of matters, fixed effect, uh, time dummy, and treatment, if, treatment dummy. Uh, this is standard fixed effect specification and I'm not going to spend time on this. Can I go to the next? Can I go to the next uh, result, the next slide? Yes, sorry. Here we have uh, the main results, and you can see that um, um, what we see in this in this table is um, mothers in the treatment group or those who received the module early in the interview re report, uh, there are 0.5 uh, uh, more food groups, and this this translates to um, to the fact that uh, a delay in in the arrival of the women's module or the women's uh, diet module leads to about eight percent reduction in the diet diversity. And this is uh, this also somehow translates to um, uh, that uh, delay reduces women's um, meeting meeting a minimum uh, food food group of by by twenty eight percent. In the next slide, uh, we we are we are doing some sample splits by uh, splitting the sample into, or mainly by by uh, splitting um, or running regressions. Uh, for, for different food groups, because uh, we thought that uh, fatigue may have differential impact on different food groups, depending on how these food groups appear uh, uh, or are consumed uh, um, in, 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 in the household. So you can see here that we have uh, three different groups. Uh, the first one is staples, beans, and nuts, and then uh, we have animal source foods, and then we have uh, vegetables and fruits. And what we can see from this table is, um, uh, uh, delaying the module uh, only affects those uh, uh, food groups which are rarely, rarely consumed or which are not frequently consumed. Um, 
this the, the side of this difference or this effect is significant. We can see that uh, a delay leads to about 8.6 percentage point reduction in the probability of reporting consumption of uh, uh, animal source foods, and this this translates to about 40 percent reduction in the share of mothers reporting consumption of animal source foods. Can I go to the next? Here are one one important question that uh, that um, we might raise is why are we seeing an underestimation instead of overestimation? Um, and I think uh, we, we don't have a definitive expl explanation so far, but I think one intuitive explanation that we thought could be uh, related to how respondents handle uh, legacy listing or um, legacy um, interviews. And I think uh, we can think of, or I think we can intuitively imagine that uh, if uh, Respondents perceive that each additional question involving a uh, yes response generates a follow-up question. Uh, they are more likely to um, to to respond yes, no to avoid this this type of uh, long long questions. Um, um, there, there could be also uh, uh, yeah uh, reasons related to lack of attention and uh, the respondents' response uh, when when uh, they are not confident about um, a question they are. They, 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 yeah, about a question that they haven't listened properly. Can I go to the next? And then here we have some heterogeneous impacts that we did by uh, by splitting the, the the sample into different using different characteristics. And what we see is um, relatively older matters, uh, and those matters with a low level of education, and those matters from uh, larger households are much more vulnerable to fatigue. Um, this, this, somehow, uh, this is intuitive to me, uh, although the, there seems no time to explain um, why, why this can be uh, intuitive. Uh, I, would for, I would like to proceed to the next slide. Okay, to conclude, um, uh, delaying uh, the timing of uh, the arrival of uh, Maddis food consumption module by 15 minutes leads, leads to Eight up to a uh, seventeen percent reduction in the diet to diversity score, and uh, this translates to about a forty percent decrease in the number of mothers who report consumption of animal source foods. There are important implications uh, um, that our uh, findings can can suggest. Um, the first uh, and uh, the most straightforward one, forward one is related to comparison of descriptive statistics, like. Um, we usually compare uh, descriptive statistics coming from different surveys and uh, even from different countries. And I think if a 15 minute reduction in or a 50 minutes delay or or difference in the placement of module can create this much difference, then this is likely to confound a uh, comparison of even descriptive statistics across um, across different surveys, uh, which which uh, which entail uh, varying placement of modules. Secondly, I think. Uh, the fact that we can see a uh, systematic difference and heterogeneous response to fatigue imply that uh, this type of delay may introduce non-classical measurement error, uh, and which have um, a significant and uh, complicated inferential implications on uh, statistical inference. And finally, um, our findings also highlight uh, the important trade off that researchers need to uh, weigh in uh, uh, when when they when, when they want to collect more information and while also uh, ensuring um, quality of data and I think uh, in the paper we are providing some suggestive um, uh, uh, some suggestive insights on how researchers can do um, uh, this trade off. Um, let me stop here and uh, yeah give the chance to Carly. So, <clears throat> what do we mean by telescoping? So. We, we often ask uh, survey respondents uh, in our surveys in, in the fields of economics, nutrition, and, and so forth, to recall things that occurred in the past, whether they experienced an economic shock in the past 12 months, whether their children had diarrhea in the past 14 days, uh, or as is the focus here, uh, we ask them to recall the amount of foods that they consumed over specific periods. Uh, so in, in economics, uh, it's, it's often the past seven days. So the question here that we are asking is whether the res uh, respondents that we have recall these things accurately. And what we worry about is, is telescoping. And, and this can be either forward or backward telescoping. Forward telescoping means that the respondents uh, recall more distant events as occurring more frequently. So for example, if a household 
uh, doesn't frequently consume eggs, uh, but they did consume eggs uh, exactly eight days ago. But for some reason, the respondent uh, responds that the, the, the consumption actually happened in the seven days uh, during during the seven day recall period uh, during the survey, which means that they would be bringing in uh, uh, this food consumption into the recall period, even though it happened uh, outside of the recall period. And backward telescoping would be the opposite of that, pushing these events uh, outside of the recall period. Next slide, please. So why would, do we care about telescoping? So when we look, think about food consumption data, it, it underpins uh, the, the tracking of, of at least two sustainable development goals of no poverty and, and zero hunger. So if we want to kind of track our progress uh, towards these goals, we need full, uh, accurate food consumption data. So telescoping uh, might overstate overall value of consumption if the respondents are systematically telescoping in uh, consumption of, of certain goods. And if this bias is large enough, we can actually have quite large effects on our poverty estimates, but also on our food security and hunger estimates that are often based on, on food consumption data. Uh, this is actually a well-known problem in the field. Uh, if, if you read uh, literature in the fields of psych psychology, economics over the last couple of decades, there's a lot of speculation about telescoping error, but uh, very few attempts to actually try to quantify the degree of this error. So this is what we try to do here. Uh, and a potential solution to, to telescoping is to use uh, what we call a bounded recall. And this was actually in, in place in the early LSMS surveys uh, that the World Bank uh, was building in the 1990s, basically having two visits to the same household and in the second visit uh, kind of bound the recall uh, to, the, to, to the respondent so that we ask about food consumption since uh, our last visit. And that's what we try to do here. So next slide, please. So, so we, what we test here is that the, uh, how this consumption uh, reports change when we use a normal approach of asking in the last seven days or using this bounded recall over the same uh, duration. So we conducted an experiment in, in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia as a part of a randomized control trial uh, endline. Um, and this was done just before the pandemic began in January, February, 2020. We have a sample of nearly 900 households and this is representative of, of the capital city. Uh, and to make sure that these two experiments that we have in place are, are not interfering with each other, we, we use kind of cross randomized uh, survey approaches. So we, we randomly assigned uh, for these experiments, the households into two groups. Uh, in the bounded group, we sent a, a survey a supervisor for a short visit, exactly seven days before the actual interview, so as to announce that they would come back for an interview in seven days um, and, and to make sure that the, the respondents uh, were able to distinguish this from other visitors, uh, the, the supervisor wore a white uniform so as to make this uh, visit a little bit more memorable. And, and the unbounded recall group is the group where we have standard consumption module with the asking just one visit and asking households to report consumption over the last seven days. So everything else is the same. We have 130 food uh, items in the consumption survey. And the two groups are similar. If we look at the characteristics in the, in the, in the household survey that we conducted a couple of months before the actual survey experiment, then importantly, their consumption levels are, are also identical. Next slide, please. So here are some early results that we have. So if we look at the distribution of, of total weekly food consumption measured in, in, in Ethiopian Ber, we see this uh, uh, two distributions here. Unbounded recall, as I said, is the, the normal way of, of, of constructing this and uh, con conducting these surveys, and bounded recall is, is what we had uh, uh, kind of innovative approach here. We see that across the board, uh, the underbounded recall group reports uh, larger consumption values. If we look at averages, uh, we see that on, on average, uh, the unbounded recall group reports 16% higher uh, food consumption uh, relative to the bounded recall group. And uh, if you think about the last seven days being the recall group, this is approximately just add, adding one day, uh, full one day into the consumption, uh, weekly consumption. Next slide, please. 
Okay. Um, so we did do a lot of uh, additional tests uh, in the paper. Uh, we look at, we, we convert this consumption into calories and proteins, and we find that the estimates are larger when we look at proteins compared to, to calories. Uh, and, and moreover, the differences are larger uh, for foods that are less frequently consumed, uh, particularly meat products that are, are not uh, very frequently consumed in this context. Uh, and we also find that uh, in terms of food security, when we look at two indicators that are based on household consumption modules, household dietary diversity score and food consumption score, we see that the, the unbounded uh, recall that is frequently used in consumption surveys tend to, um, tend to overestimate uh, food security uh, when compared to the, the bounded recall approach. Next slide, please. So obviously, when we do these types of experiments, we need to think about also the costs. So the additional cost of adding this one visit uh, to these households in this contest was only $3.50 per household. Uh, but we do find big implications uh, for our data, uh, for the data that we're collecting, especially for less frequently consumed foods. Uh, this can also affect poverty complications as consumption seems to be overstated. However, it depends on how we actually calculate the poverty lines. Are they updated uh, with the survey data or are they kind of uh, coming from uh, earlier surveys? Uh, this is, this uh, experiment was conducted in urban area and uh, we need to know better what this means in rural areas where this cost of doing the second visit might be much, much higher because it's difficult to reach households, in particular in rural Ethiopia. But then again, the diets are less diverse. The households are less frequently consuming uh, animal source food. So it would be interesting to see how this plays out in rural areas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and now we're going to have um, some discussion uh, from Andrew Dillon, who is a clinical associate professor of development economics within uh, Kellogg's public private interface initiative. And he is also the director of the research methods cluster in the Global Poverty Research Lab at Northwestern University. So he is always working on these issues um, and has uh, a lot of experience. So we are excited to hear his thoughts um, on these projects. Thank you so much, Andrew, for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, uh, Kate, Sylvan, Kabram, and Kale for uh, inviting me to read your paper and hear more about this work. Um, as an ex if pre uh, uh, researcher, it's great to see and to place these papers in a long context of work that IFPRI's done on field methods. Um, that's really fundamental um, to understanding policy implications and and having good descriptive statistics about what's going on in the world and and how to change that through policy. Um, so this work, I think really fits in that context of, of survey experiments and dedication to field research um, that, that IFPRI's done over a long period of time. So that's really exciting to see. Um, next slide. I just wanted to focus my comments around a couple things just to get the conversation started. So one is about context, the next is about the contributions of these papers, and lastly is about where I see frontiers and kind of the survey experiment um, work going forward. Um, and it's great to see these papers because, as I mentioned, IFBRI's had a long history of doing this kind of work um, and being dedicated to field research. Um, but the field as a whole is starting to appreciate these um, types of papers a little bit more. So um, there's a great annual review of economics uh, reviewed by um, DeWart et al., um, which reviews the survey experiment literature. Um, they have a really great discussion on identification challenges, objective standards, and motivation for why research matters um, for policy research. Um, there's lots more to do in this space, and it's really great to see these papers filling in some of the gaps related to attention and recall bias um, in this work. Um, there's also a few forthcoming papers coming out. There's a Handbook of Agricultural Economics, which focuses on measurement error and coverage bias, um, and the way that survey methods over the last uh, 10 to 15 years have uh, filled in some of those gaps and improved what we do in the field and what we're learning. Um, and then there's also an update to the Reardon and Glebe chapter um, from the Blue Books on uh, agricultural questionnaire design. 
um, that's coming out, which focuses particularly on how shifts um, in the unit of analysis and using panel data has really altered the way we do design choices in um, agricultural survey design. And so these papers fit in nicely into that literature. And as you can tell, because of this flood of kind of recent work, there's a lot of work that's going on. So um, next slide. Um, so what do we learn in particular from these papers? Um, so just to kind of summarize a few of the main results, I think we learned that um, including dietary diversity modules or uh, earlier in a survey um, has order effects, attention effects potentially um, on dietary diversity by about uh, 0.25 food items. Um, when we think about labor modules and we look at the order in which individuals are interviewed, um, we see that there are fewer jobs reported later, um, the person is listed, um, and that has some larger effects for women and youth. And on the consumption side, uh, we look at this bounded recall experiment um, that Kelly and his co-authors uh, uh, implemented, and we see that telescoping actually increases consumption by about a full day of consumption. So when we look at these results, we take them together as a whole, I think it's important to ask about survey experiment papers in general. Why is this important? What are we learning? And how does this change what we do in the field? And so I think one of the first order questions for you as an audience to think about is kind of what are the magnitudes of these effect sizes? And the reason that that's important is because in any multi-topic survey, we face trade-offs and design choices. And we're going to have to balance some biases on certain types of questions with other biases on other types of questions. So are these uh, economically meaningful magnitudes? Um, and, and how do they bias um, you know, our, our data? And are those trade-offs in, in costs that a lot of the authors talked about you know, worth the reduction in bias? The second thing that I think is important about um, these papers and, and to think about maybe more in the future is we really want to know how whether this measurement error not only affects um, you know descriptive statistics but also economically meaningful relationships. So are these measurement errors big enough to bias treatment effects or parameter estimates for um, meaningful economic behavioral relationships? So things like calorie income elasticities, Ingalls curves, return to education, or labor supply. How would these measurement errors potentially bias those relationships? I think this is really important for survey experiment work because we not only want to improve the field methods we use to improve measurement, but we also want to know how reliable our policy implications are that come out of this type of field work. So those types of questions are really important as well. Um, next slide. Um, so the last thing in terms of contributions that I would say these papers make is thinking about how we do field work. So for example, in the household labor experiment, listing of household members is often linked, as, as the paper talks about, into the household roster listing. So does intentionally asking about certain household members in another order improve job reporting in some way? Now, this is something that would be important to, to know. So the survey experiment paper randomizes the order so that they can potentially estimate a, a, a causal effect. Right? But now we need to know what kind of implication it is on the truth and what, uh, what, what the implications of that ordering is on uh, real job reporting. Right? Um, in terms of uh, the dietary diversity paper, um, we learned that prioritizing the module ordering may reduce measurement error or, or increase uh, reporting of dietary diversity in, in some way. So I think for the larger literature, it's good to think about so which are the modules that are kind of the most sensitive to order effects? And how do interviewers or, or respondents think about um, uh, reporting information on surveys? What's most natural for them to report about and in which order? Um, and in terms of consumption um, measurement, um, when we think about uh, uh, the feasibility of higher frequency consumption measurement as the telescope paper implies is that by having more frequent observations of consumption, we can reduce telescoping error. Um, where is this likely to be most important? Um, so probably in areas with high seasonality. Um, and, and are there, uh, in addition to thinking about targeting when we should do more frequent um, measurement of consumption, 
for example, when there is high seasonality? Are there other survey design choices we can make which also may counteract that, um, that uh, telescoping bias by thinking about maybe using diaries or different monitoring techniques or consumption item lists? So other trade-offs would also be important to think about, I think, in addition to um, additional visits. So lastly, I'll just leave you with a couple thoughts about um, frontiers in, in survey experiments. So as some of the papers do, um, they think about heterogeneity. So it's really important to ask not only if there's a measurement error bias, but, but why that is. And ideally, we'd like to unpack this heterogeneity due to respondent characteristics, either observable or unobserved. Um, ideally, we would use survey experiments to better tailor survey design to different types of respondents. I think a big fallacy in the literature often when we design surveys is to think that respondents are of one type, right? But actually, lots of different people think about these survey questions in, in different ways. So how do we design or tailor surveys to different types of respondents, I think is important to think about. Um, also in survey design experiments, we often see comparisons between two options, which is often a good comparison technique if we have an objective truth. But in many survey design experiments, we don't have an objective truth. So how we interpret those data then becomes a little bit complicated. Um, so I think in the design of surveys, one of the things we're gonna have to continue to grapple with in design and identification challenges is, is what our comparison group is, right? Um, and last thing, I would just put in a plug for this type of work um, going forward in the future. We really need to make the case as a research community, as people who do field research, that methods were really in the past year were a hero we didn't know we needed. <laughs> um, in response to COVID-19, we've learned a lot and been able to generate a lot of policy relevant information because we were able to integrate telephone surveys into existing operations. There's still a lot more to learn about telephone surveys and a lot of limitations of telephone surveys, but they're a tool we now know better and have been able to demonstrate that having methodological innovation in our toolkit allows us to say something in times of response or pandemic or uncertain situations where face-to-face -face interviews aren't possible. Um, I think in the future, we're gonna think more about interoperability instead of just one mode of, of data collection. So thinking about how household surveys, remote sensing and telephone surveys fit together to create a better interview experience for respondents is something I think we would all benefit from, from thinking about. And these types of survey experiment papers are the basis, the evidence that we need to take forward into those discussions um, to think about those things going forward. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, and I'll turn uh, the, the uh, panel back over to Kate. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was a great discussion. And thanks to all the presenters um, for uh, their presentations. Um, so now we have a few minutes for question and answer. Um, so if the presenters could come back on screen, um, I'll just jump right in with like a few specific questions that we have and then we um, maybe a couple of general questions for everyone. Um, Selvin, starting with you, uh, we have a question from Eva Maria Egger who wants to know if we can check how the results um, differ by gender and age of the main respondent in the estimates of fatigue, um, and do the gender biases look different if you do that? Uh, to clarify, we, we, I think you mean not of the respondent per se, but of the household member, right, of the person being responded about. Uh, mm -hmm. And we could, I forget if we've looked at that yet, basically at that point we start getting very small cells, and so we just felt like we were pushing the data really hard and didn't want to go too much further. Um, we could we could look again. I, I guess a different question. I think the question first. is about the the respondent. The respondent. Yeah. Okay. So so the respondent who's answering on behalf of everyone in their household. We have looked certainly by uh, male and female, and we saw that the effects of fatigue are stronger on men, um, meaning that they start leaving things off more quickly than women do. Um, we haven't pushed that too hard in the paper up to this point. Uh, there's a lot going into why men versus women were chosen in different households, so we didn't want to go too far with that. Um, but we do think that's interesting and could like point in a direction for future work. I don't know that we really checked by age at this point. 
Thanks. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Sylvan. Um, Kale, uh, a question from Ann Swindale at USAID. Uh, so um, when the survey supervisor uh, went for the sort of telescoping marker visit, um, did the survey supervisor say what the interview in seven days would cover? Um, like, would it be a survey of consumption? I'm guessing that the idea here is whether or not the respondent was kind of primed to be thinking about what they were going to be consuming over the next seven days by that visit. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I should have mentioned that. So yeah, it was just a kind of appointment visit. Uh, we made sure that they did not uh, prime then start thinking about consumption or anything like that. It was just a, a quick visit to say we're coming in seven days. Hope you like. Great. Um, Kabram, a question for you. Um, so I think it's interesting, you know, we have two papers here on fatigue, um, you know, taking different approaches. Um, yours is uh, looking at module placement, um, but you also used a phone survey as opposed to an in-person survey. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how important um, the fact that it was a phone survey was to your results. Do you think that there would have been, I mean, obviously it's speculation, but do you think there would have been any differences had you been doing an in-person survey? Well, that's a valid question. I think, yeah, uh, this is a question that we have been also asking ourselves. And uh, if we get a chance to try it, we'll, we would be happy to try it, but in, in a in a face to face survey. But I agree that, yeah, the impact, I, I, I still, feel that the impact might be higher in phone surveys because um, because enumerators have limited control of um, the interview environment also and also uh, a feeling of how the respondent is 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 functioning I mean like you cannot see what whether the respondent is getting tired or whether he needs a break or whether he needs uh, some some hot clarification so I think I, I agree I mean it, it might be more pronounced in the case of phone surveys, but um, I feel that it might be also relevant to in in face to face surveys, and we are looking for an opportunity to try it in for, in in face to face surveys. Um, great, and just we ha we do have still a few more minutes for questions. So if anyone wants to ask a question, you still have a chance to put it into the chat box. Please feel free to do so. Um, so one for both Kale and Kibram on, uh, you know, your surveys are, are similar in that you're studying uh, similar outcomes, consumption, dietary diversity. And both of you seem to find that um, sort of special foods are the ones that are most effective if I was interpreting um, your results correctly. Uh, can you reflect on that a little bit more and just like, why do we think that's the case and what does that mean really for the way that we should be thinking about our consumption modules? Um, Kale first and then and then Kabram. Yeah, uh, I think in our case, it's, it's, it's of, of, of great uh, importance because, uh, and I think the story goes something along, like, along the lines of, of this where, uh, if the respondent is, is consuming eggs, for example, every single morning, uh, uh, for example, uh, two eggs per day, then it's very easy for them to remember that on, over the period of seven days, it's, it's 14 eggs. But if it's uh, less frequent items, uh, res less frequently consumed items, you cannot use this kind of rate-based uh, approximation when you're responding to these uh, survey questions. So therefore, that's why for for less frequently consumed items, especially meats in this context, uh, uh, we start to see this effect. So there is kind of a theoretical explanation to it. Over to Kipra. Yeah, uh, exactly. I was going to say that. And I think um, this is not the first case where we show that um, uh, less frequently consumed items are prone to uh, different sorts of measurement here. They have been also shown that um, they are prone to recall bias. Uh, and I think th there are other papers showing that. And th the reason is exactly what Kale said. I mean, if you're consuming bread every day, uh, you, it's, it's like, like less, more likely that it comes up um, to your mind when, when you're asking about something. Uh, great. Um, okay, so one other question here that I think could go to anyone who has an answer. Um, have any of, in any of these projects, have we, 
have we tested for differences by interviewer, like enumerator effects, as opposed to respondent or respondent type? Um, and I know Sylvan could at least answer this one. <laughs> um, I don't know about the others. So, I mean, we've, we've explored this. I can't say that we've tested it. Um, to test would, you know, in some way try and find variation in who you assign to who. Um, we did look at some things such as like, was it late in the day or early in the day for the, for the, for the enumerator themselves? Uh, we looked at some things as to whether it was early or late in the overall tenure of the um, interview themselves. We really didn't see any meaningful differentiation there with respect to the individual's placement in the labor module, if that makes sense. So again, our, our paper's focused on the fatigue induced within the labor module, and that dimension of fatigue is not affected by the enumerator. Now we do see really big differences as far as like, you know, enumerators may be getting faster with how they conduct a survey and other things that you can certainly imagine could also affect data collection, but not in a way that affected sort of the result that we are presenting as that variation that comes by the randomized ordering. Right, and we did try to look at like whether better enumerators were yep, based on yep. scores in That's training true. were um, more, susceptible to this and we didn't really find that that was um was motivating our findings um any other thoughts um on enumerator effects obviously an important issue in this space yeah okay <laughs> great well um i do think that that's something uh to explore that people should we should have in mind when we're thinking about these methodological questions because we do know that like how enumerators ask questions can really have an impact um all right, um, so we had one question about uh, that wanted to know more about the specifics of the models on the estimation process for employment and consumption. I think we don't really have time to go into the details, but um, the slides and the recordings will all be available. And um, I believe there's links to the papers of, as well that you can um, that have those details um, in great detail on, on all the estimation. Um, okay, I have uh, maybe one of the final questions um, for everyone, this is kind of just going off of what Andrew was talking about in terms of, you know, trade-offs in surveys and um, I, I, listening to everyone talk, I, I'm thinking, you know, we could do any experiment on survey methodology and we might find these differences. Um, so given that we see different issues and all these different types of questions, how do we make what do you all think, um, how do we make the decisions about which are the most important um, ones to address? Because there are going to be these trade-offs. Like, what do you put earlier versus what do you put later in the survey? And that sort of thing. Um, and or um, if you don't have those answers, which is understandable because this is such an open area, what are your suggestions or thoughts on future research questions that could help us get to those um, to those quest to those answers. Um, Sylvan, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I guess my broad answer is it really depends on what you're prioritizing with your data collection. I mean, if you are doing a nutrition study, then it seems pretty clear we should be doing some of these nutrition modules earlier than the last module in the whole survey. Um, for us in our instance, I mean, again, like what if you would actually want to randomize the labor labor order, order mo like matters depending on what you out, how you plan to use that labor data later on. If you want to make these broad characterizations across gender or age group, then you might want to randomize. If you're just wanting to capture the most things that a household is doing in total, maybe you do it in an order where you list the people who are the primary earners first. So I think a lot of it really comes down to your context and your objectives. It's much harder if you're doing like an LSMS study where you're trying to provide a big public good. And then you kind of have turf battles over what topics different people think are more or less important, or as Andrew said, which ones are more sensitive. And I think that that's where more evidence will really help. Yeah, uh, Kiram, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, yeah. Uh, I think uh, first I would like to echo what, what Andrew said. Um, what we have here is more of uh, the first stage. And I think there is one more step to show how consequential are this, uh, this errors uh, to statistical inferences, like I mean, we are not able to show that in our paper, and but we hope to show that I mean, is it just uh, this type of errors distort uh, descriptive statistics, or 
they also affect our predictive inference. Uh, so that, that's the first tip that I would definitely uh, would want to see researchers pursuing that. Um, yes, I think in terms of, um, I think like, like Sullivan said, in terms of uh, prioritizing um, the type of, or I think I would say the purpose of research. I mean, it is very important that, I mean, traditionally I see that um, we have like 80 pages questionnaire that are, I think, somehow independently uh, like assembled. And I think it, it is very important to, to critically evaluate how, how, this, um, how this can affect the quality of data. I mean, like, imagine like if someone is sitting with you for the next um, three hours, and I think it is going to be challenging to, yeah. uh, I mean, you can collect some information, but I think there should be a way of weighing that uh, and properly optimizing uh, the, the amount of information that you want to collect and the quality of data that you want to issue. Great. Yeah, uh, Kale, any 30 seconds, any last thoughts? Yeah, I, I would like to see more of these kind of systematic projects uh, that really look, take into a, a survey module and try to think really hard how to do that. So the kind of pioneering work that uh, John Gibson, Kathleen Beagle, Joachim de Wert have been doing in Tanzania, the project that team was funding, this kind of efforts, I would love to see more of this. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's um, a little bit of like what we were just saying that more research that could help us understand which types of questions are the most sensitive would really help researchers evaluate these trade-offs. So, um, you know, the work that we're doing, the work that Andrew's doing, the work that others at the World Bank are doing, the LSMS team, it's all super important. Um, look forward to seeing more of it. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to everyone. Um, again, the recording and the slides will be available on the PIM site. Please um, feel free to email us if you have any uh, further questions about any of the, the presentations. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for joining uh, us today.